evening. Welcome to another More Than Walking video podcast discussion, where we seek to encourage and bring about awareness on a variety of topics. I'm your host, Fees, an aspiring artist here in Connecticut, and we are going to be talking about relationships post-injury, which is not so much of a taboo subject, but it's a realistic um, question that people um, who sustain a disability, especially in the SDI community, how does one go forward from here, Um, especially when it comes down to uh, romance and exploring the dating scene? Before we get into uh, tonight's questions, I just want, you know, everybody to just introduce yourself and tell me what do you do like for recreational time? I'm Dr. Mitchell Tepper. Uh, I am a sexologist, which means I spend my life uh, studying human sexuality because I'm just a very curious person. My PhD is actually in human sexuality educator. So a lot of people assume I'm a medical doctor or a psychologist, but I'm not. I'm an educator and a researcher. I do FES two or three times a week for an hour. So I'm fortunate. I broke my neck at work as a lifeguard and I have workers' compensation. So I'm taking care of as far as what my needs are for, for equipment. So I do FES a few times a week. I hit the gym lately just once a week, but I'd like to do it more. Uh, in the summertime, I'm swimming outside in the pool a bit. During COVID, I didn't want to go. And then when things were getting better, I just, I really just don't go like swimming inside. Uh, uh, this season's getting nicer, so I'll start playing a little tennis on Sundays. Uh, I got a hand cycle. So I guess a lot of my quote unquote leisure activity uh, is, is recreational sports related uh, and volunteering here in Georgia. I'm the vice president of United Spinal Association, Atlanta. And, uh, you know, I wrote a grant for us and we were fortunate to get some significant money from the Craig Nielsen Foundation to start an adaptive esports program. Mm. Although I'm, I'm not a gamer, uh, I thought it was important to have some options, especially for folks who are really higher level quads, uh, you know, because when a lot of our activities are social and recreational, uh, but right. the highest level people really can't participate fully. So with adaptive esports, you know, we have, uh, you know, a, like a fitting kit. We have a lot of equipment. Uh, we could help people get set up uh, here in, here in Georgia. So I think I'm going to take it upon myself to uh, get some adaptations and learn to video, play video games at 60 years old. Nice, nice. Um, with Now with the FES bike, do you do the upper and the lower half? Uh, I do my abs uh, and lower. So, you know, I have... Uh, 16 uh 12 or 16 electrodes hooked up and for those out there who don't know what fes is functional electric stimulation it's a bike that allows certain muscle groups to be stimulated and you can do your upper body as far as your arms uh your biceps your trapezoids etc and you can also do your legs as well i have an fes bike uh myself so you know i've been using it since 2010 and I actually was able to be on the local news station um, here in CT uh, when uh, the local hospital, Mount Sinai, and Hartford's uh, rehab um, department uh, first got there. So I was kind of like the guinea pig for it. So I'm definitely familiar with the FES bike. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, I'll let you do that. Nice. And we're going we're gonna to talk about gaming in one second. But John, what do you do for, for recreational uh, time? Oh man, it's gonna sound so boring. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to audiobooks. Post pandemic, I hope to get on my hand cycle uh, a lot more. Um, Post winter, <laughs> my hand cycle a lot more. And I don't know. Those those are the two main things. Uh, love driving, watching movies. I mean, uh, not a huge amount, but oh, and and painting. I I love love to paint. Karaoke occasionally. Nice, nice. Let me find out. I have to put you on a track. But that'd be cool. I've always wondered this um, about, you know, uh, quads who can drive. How is it like with the hand controls? Is it easy to manipulate? Is it difficult? Like, you know, if you're like, I'm about to go 80 and like, you got to break real quick. Are you like nervous or like, how does that work out? I went from a manual uh, gas and brake to a whole electrical gas and brake. And I tell you, it was a lot of fun. So there's like a throttle. You put your hand in the throttle. For, okay. for me, it was forward for gas, back for brake. The throttle is so short. Here, in a matter of an inch, 
you're full throttle. So you're, you're you know, you're, you're like, it's like a race car. And then, but the brake was equally sensitive. So like, okay. if you came up on something with this electronic gas and brake and you flinch, you're locking them up <laughs> until uh-huh. you get used to it. But what level are you, Corey? I am C4, C5. So like, I just have movement in my uh, shoulders. So, so I'm when- unable to drive again. How are you driving your power chair with your hand? Uh, yeah, so I have like a chin um, control, so I just use my mouth uh, on it and I just drive like that. So if you if you have resources, uh, you could drive your vehicle very much like you drive your chair. See, you know? that's what I've been wanting to it's look just, into. I don't know who's going to get in the car with me, though. It, yeah, it's just... It's just <laughs> They're going to be like, nah, I'm good. It's very ex- expensive, but I, but you can drive that amount of movement and it you know it may be scary at first but there there are people who do it all right listen i'm gonna explore that because that's one thing that i miss driving even though it's like it's an ironic thing i miss driving but i drive all day yeah. like in a chair you know what i mean so yeah. there's some there's some irony to it but um thank you for that a different level of it's a Not, different nothing level of freedom nothing <laughs> nothing beats going you know 60 when you're just putting around it exactly <laughs> I, I tell people i'm just like you know it goes seven and a half that's pretty fast for chair you know what i mean they're just like all right you know slow down when you hit them corners especially like when i'm dipping in the house but um no that's cool i definitely will uh, check into that for me recreational activities um so i i do music so i record um there's a studio um in manchester that i go to that's handicap accessible and you know i put out um few projects and it's very therapeutic because that's what I was doing before um I got hurt um although I was in the Navy I, I've always done music even back in high school so just being able to write and um record is, is just very very um much of a release uh, for me and then the other thing I do um uh, outside of like my family and just spending time with them is uh I game you know going back to what you said huh. and I discovered um not, it wasn't last year it was a few years before that uh jonathan had um somebody uh do a video where they were gaming and then they had the quad stick and i had been searching for some ability to possibly play video games and when i saw this gentleman uh using a quad stick it prompted me to go look more into it and from that point on last year um for my birthday i, I purchased a quad stick is they're very expensive um however it's worth uh, the price of admission because now I can sit there and I can play PlayStation again. And up until that point, I didn't play video games since 2005. Uh, yeah. So having that ability, you know, is, is very nice. Um, and now I, I can be able to, you know, play video games with my kids eventually um, once they get a part of it. But, you know, it's nice. It's not as difficult as it may sound. It uses the sip and puff um, mechanism and those each of the sips or the puffs is in relationship to which button to press on the controller and you can manipulate it. They have like a whole entire program that you can download onto the quad stick for different games that you choose. So it's very possible for people like myself, high level quads or people with limited um, hand movements to be able to um, still enjoy gaming. So that's You've got to I'm connect doing. that to the car. Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, it, like as good as I am, like on the game, you know what I mean? Like I, I probably should be able to drive with that. So that would be nice. And, uh, you know, when I was in Connecticut, I helped start sale Connecticut Access. And that, you know, gave me the opportunity to, to race and go all over. And well, I, I was on my own up in Vancouver, but I, I did watch somebody sail a boat with Sip and Puff. Wow. So you really can, you know, with the right uh, adaptations and controls, do anything. Sky's the limit for, for sure. But, you know, thank you guys for sharing that. And as I stated before, we're here to talk about relationships post-injury and you know a very important thing for men and women to find connections we long for relationships with whether they're um just with friends or you know on the romantic side because we want to feel loved we want to feel appreciated and we don't want to feel rejected and our injury can often lead to feelings of rejection and resentfulness by others sometimes even people's spouses which you know can lead to divorce, um, even if you're in a just a um, regular relationship or so, people tend to like uh, walk away. And I read like a series 
a story. Some were beautiful, some were, you know, painful to um, to read in terms of what made the relationship work and what are some of the reasons why people uh, decided to leave, which brings me to our first question. Um, so pledging one's fealty during a wedding is customary when expressing your devotion. A traditional vow includes the phrase in sickness and in health. This is a reassurance of absoluteness, yet so many separate or divorce after one spouse becomes injured. All things considered, is it fair or justifiable for a person to become absent when they promise to be present prior to injury? And this doesn't have to just necessarily be about um, marriage, but even in reg you know, typical relationship, uh, somebody may have a promise ring and they vow to be, you know, their undying love, you know, to somebody. Do you think it's fair for a person to walk away after they have felt like they're going to be devoted to you? You know, there's there's a lot of reasons why relationships don't work out in general. And I know that one of my my first uh, one of my first few friends uh, when once I became disabled um, in India, you know, he he believed that you know after a spinal cord injury or after a disability, your personality changes. Like you can do no wrong. You've, you've become disabled and, and you've learned all your life lessons and you have to be a good person from, from then on, right? Um, he had this very over-idealistic perception of, of what happens to human beings when they get injured. And uh, he was very surprised when some of our mutual friends just were very mean to him and were like, that didn't follow through with his, point of view and I think it's really complex you know uh, mm. just because someone leaves post-injury doesn't necessarily mean it's because of the disability it could also be because of you know the maturity level of the person who is injured their response how do they deal with it emotionally um, how dependent do they become emotionally on, on someone or are they able to wade through it you know that all for the you know the, the same reasons that cause trouble in in normal uh, in quote unquote normal able bodied relationships, I think the same things can happen. But in terms of if it is because of a disability, I mean, I personally am a little biased on this, but being a C7 quad for since 2006, I, it's, it's unfortunate. I think the person who, who becomes absent, especially when they promise to, to be there through thick and thin because of a disability, is really missing an opportunity to have a, a wonderful, beautiful, uh, challenging experience. I mean, what's life if not that, you know? So mm -hmm. they're really, they're missing out and I, I feel bad for them. And of course, it's it's really hard on the person who's being left. And I don't think it is fair, but it happens. But there's always, if that happens, there's, there's always more relationships to be had. I think it's the important thing to remember. So being, being in this position, right? So you're able to look at it like in hindsight, do you think you would have the same response if the shoe were on the other foot, whether you were with somebody initially or you met somebody who had a disability, um, do you think you would approach it the same way? I mean, I, I would I would hope so. You mean like if I didn't have a disability? Yeah, like so, you know, one thing you mentioned were like the complexities and, and you know, I kind of paraphrase what you said said like you know maturity of mind and heart you know as far as like a person walking away you know what I mean it's just a variety of reasons but if if the shoe were on the other foot and you were in a relationship and, the, and your significant other or your girlfriend uh, had gotten injured do you think you would still have that same maturity of of mind or or even somebody who has a disability would you look at that person and have the same type of feelings that you have now to be able to look kind of past it in order to, um, you know, be present in their life? I, I think so. And I would hope so. My parents were very open with us kids. I have two older brothers, mm. you know, when, when they had fights or when they had difficulties and they would reconcile with each other, like in the living room, they wouldn't go to their bedroom to have fights. They would do it in the kitchen in the living room. There were their three boys running around <laughs> in the midst of it. So nice. I really, and I, you know, there were even some times where they were really, they were really upset and, and I, you know, I had conversations with them. They, they allowed me to engage with them. I really feel like they gave me an example that no matter what kind of challenge you have, it's a choice whether you wade through it or not. It's not a, there's nothing inevitable. There's nothing like we can't do this. We can't get over this. You can, it's just, 
Nice. Do you do you value? You know, is there something more valuable on the other side to be had in your mind versus mm. what you're facing right now? And the answer for them was always yes. And I think that can always be the answer, unless it's yeah. I mean, unless it's something else like not disability, but you're in an abusive relationship or something like that. You know, it's a whole right. other ball game. But no, no, that's no. fine. How about yourself, Mitch? So I think um, Jonathan said it so beautifully when he really expounded on the complexities in a relationship. So I have a, just a couple of comments. Um, one, you know, is, is it fair? I don't think it's helpful to ask that question, you know, especially as someone whose partner left them, you know, because mm-hmm. fair or unfair, it's not a fruitful route to follow you know i mean is it fair that we got injured you know what i mean it's it's just it is what it is justifiable you know is it justifiable to someone to break a contract to break a commitment uh, under some circumstances because of complexity uh it may be justifiable at least to the person who's leaving it might not be justifiable to the person who was you know uh, let's use the word abandoned or their partner left them. So, uh, but like you said, uh, you know, we all have um, our, our, our personalities and, you know, sometimes your partner, you know, if you have a partner, it's more than just their, their physical disability. It's the way they deal with their disability. So, and if that way is through anger and lashing out, right. And if somebody isn't, um, prepared to deal with that they may not stick it out but you know it it goes to this really what i think you want to discuss next is is love right Right. so and when we talk about love when we talk about someone leaving you in a committed relationship because your 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 example was a wedding right right? right. just more so not so much um like the wedding is just the notion of But a committed, a long, let's call it a long-term committed relationship. Right. And usually people do that in this country based on love. That we're not, you know, matched up, right? We're not fixed up. We're not arranged marriage. We do it because we're in love. Right. So often just the foundations of relationship are based on a feeling, a feeling of being in love. But that feeling isn't always accurate, you know? So often when people are in love, they think they're in love. You know, they, they, they feel good. I'm not going to say they don't feel good. But sometimes love could be narcissistic. What I mean by that mm-hmm. is I love the way you make me feel. You know, I, I love going around with you on my arm, you know, because, you know, I got this great catch. Or I love, you know, the way you cook for me. Or I love the way you have sex with me, right? But they don't love or they don't really articulate or focus on uh, the characteristics and what they love about that person. And so if your love is, is a superficial love based on how you make me feel and say I was an adventure, adventurous type of person who liked to hike and run and bike. And that's what I was looking for, a like-minded partner. Now my like-minded partner who liked to do the things I do can no longer do those things, at least without adaptation, ad, adaptations. And so the, the well, oh no, because I loved you because I like to do these things with you. If we can't do these things together, you know, what else do we have? So maybe there is a deep appreciation for the other people's characteristics and their qualities, and they choose to stay. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it was just because you were a fun partner, you know, wow. and if you can't you know, it, have fun you know, with me like that, then you're not there's no value in me staying in this relationship. So we really have to look at when we talk about people splitting up after an injury, we have to look at what was the foundation of that. And just one last word. So Mm -hmm. I just finished a documentary called love after war and it's about injured veterans, right. And their road back to, uh, or their battle, you know, for love. And, and I tell people the, the movie is about, or documentary is much about compassionate love. And that's, the ability to love somebody when they can't love you back. So if your partner has PTSD or brain injury and is behaving badly, but, you know, as one woman said, you know, I I remembered who he was and I knew he was still in there. And so if you really love somebody deeply for who they are and they have an injury 
And even if they can't reciprocate your love for a while because of their injuries or maybe for a long time, a deep, compassionate love loves even when the other person can't love you back. So that, that that's all I want to say. You know, when we talk about love and and the feeling of love is 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 a, as I also talk about, you know, the the romantic fantasy that Cupid shoots an arrow in your heart, right? Right. But but really, usually Cupid aims too low and it gets you in the genitals, right? Yeah. So so people are usually you know and in passion, you know, more than in, in love. So yeah, the, these things are, are complex and, and they go to the foundation of the relationship and what it was based on. I agree with that. Um, you know, the, it, it is rooted in um, foundational principles, not solely off of emotion. And oftentimes that's what people tend to live out in their relationship is like an R&B song or, or a great uh, pop melody because those provoke feelings of good emotion. I like the way that you do this or the way that you do that. But what happens when that person is unable to do the things in the way, in the manner in which you've grown accustomed to? And and that oftentimes leads to these, you know, citations of irreconcilable differences. And you often wonder like, well, what was it based off of before now that uh, something catastrophic may have happened or you two just Uh, tend to bicker and argue because you can't see each other's um, side. So, you know, I think focusing on those qualitative aspects in a person's character, um, you know, can be ultimately uh, sufficient. Uh, For me, the way I looked at it is I think that when we commit to anything or someone, I think you have to have a perpetual preparedness, meaning that it's always ongoing and it varies. You know, I've been married to my wife uh, going on 13 years uh, this um, September and I'm still learning her. And because I'm open-minded to learning her and the subtle changes that are going to happen because as we get older, we get, you know, things are different. I also recognize that her meeting me being that she was able-bodied and I'm not, she was able to look past that and being able to commit to me regardless of you know seeing the worst you know that could quote unquote possibly happen um seeing me in um in sickness and health and it helped you know shore up the fact that i think our foundation is strong it's it's rooted in god it's rooted on uh transparency and and open communication and those are things that are um intangible you know it, it would get me frustrated when you know, you, you see people in relationships and things change because a person is unable to deal with, um, for instance, the caregiving aspect of it, which, you know, even when you're trying to prepare prior to that, you don't know what the financial consequences are going to be. And one thing um, I had looked up was different states that they don't necessarily pay spouses for being caregivers, right? And some of these couples regardless of loving each other and sickness and health, one couple, um, they thought about getting a divorce on paper just to be able to receive the benefits that should be owed to them regardless. Because, you know, oftentimes the spouse has to quit their job and they have to take care of their uh, significant other full time. And, And I think something like that, if you feel like you had to go to the brink of having a divorce, it, in some ways it shows like how committed you are to the person, even though that may come across as uh, being taboo, you know what I mean? I have but, yeah, good go friends that, that did that, you know, he had MS. They planned because he was progressively getting worse. They, they planned that he, they got a divorce because they knew he was going to have to go into, uh, or he wanted to, was their choice, but he was going to go into a, a nursing home and they didn't want to bankrupt the family. So they got right. divorced, lived together. Then he went into the nursing home, which was really only a couple blocks away. And it was it was what he wanted. I think she might have cared for him, but but that's but that's how they did it. And and they're not the only people who who've done things like that. Like you said, to take advantage yeah. of it. it's unfortunate. You know, like just this talk about love and commitment. Um, I remember my dad saying to me a long time ago that love is a verb. You know, it's an action. It's something that you mm-hmm. got to actually show uh, forth. So it leads me to question two: the term love is thrown around loosely and it's rare to catch it and hold on to it. If you could capture love and bottle it up, 
where would you keep it and what would you be willing to do to never let it go? And I throw that at you, Doc. Keep it in my heart. <laughs> so, you know, so, I keep it here where it, where it feels good, you know, mm. uh, where it warms me up, where it, you know, keeps me running and animates me. Uh, and uh, what would you be willing to do to never let it go? I guess I'd be willing to uh, be open to my partner, to be vulnerable to them, to, you know, um, to treat my partner well to keep that love you know nice how about you john yeah uh close to the heart um the bloodstream you know it's uh i guess it's it's all kind of cliche but Mm. um where else if not inside you running through your veins ideally i would i would love to be fully motivated by love all the time Mm. and of course that's not always possible but it would be great to be infused (laughs) you know uh with love um the desire desire to love my wife who's been married five years love my neighbor love my friends um get rid of the anxiety that often fills its place (laughs) wow but uh replace that with love um what would i be willing to do to never let it go uh i think always being willing to to not to not win, to be willing to to wait for for victory, whatever that means. If it's you know in, in terms of you know being being patient, being thoughtful, putting the other person first, um, not winning the fight, not winning that argument, right. you know, not being defensive. I think those are all really important attributes for a successful uh, long term relationship. I think you're speaking to a broader issue, right? Like, so we talk about. Um, you said about loving a person and not waiting to win. I think that's cool because sometimes, I, and, and probably in a, in a lot of uh, people's minds and thoughts, they probably feel like, not that we're the victim, but some of our frustrations may be able to kind of like supersede what our spouse's frustration may be, right? So we might feel like, I'm making this valid point. You don't understand. You're not in a wheelchair you don't have to wait on care. You don't have to do this. But then on the flip side of that, she has to wait too. She has to be patient. She has to be kind. She has to be able to exhibit that. And just because you are in a position where you didn't choose to be that way does not not make every point you make valid. And it doesn't make you always right in those situations. And even, I, and I, say that again? Even if you're right in a relationship, they said sometimes it's better to be kind than to be right. So you yeah. could win the fight and lose the battle. Because mm. if you're if you always have to prove that you're right, when sometimes it's just not that important, right? If you always have to fight to win, you could be damaging your relationship, you know. So you have to really pick and choose which it's all cliche, Jonathan, but you have to pick and choose your battles. You know, in picking and choosing um battles, and that's gonna lead to question three about uh communication. I know for me. Because I don't have the use of my arms, so I'm not able to point. I find myself explaining things in a great detail. Uh, you can see it in even like when I answer a question, like I break things down in a very um, explicit way and it's very uh, candid. But because I have to explain myself often, because I don't have any other way to uh, get my point across, it always sounds or can sound like I'm trying to win or like I'm being on the defensive. And, and it's really not that. I, like my, my heart's desire and Jonathan uh, put it eloquently is just being motivated by love full time. Like my intent is to always communicate that my, that my thoughts and my mind is not trying to win the argument, but I want you to understand where I was coming from and let's work together to figure out the best solution going forward. But in communicating it like, so, you know, vividly, sometimes it could be like, okay, I hear you. You know what I mean? But, um, you know, yeah, you, you got to focus on uh, not trying to be the victor all the time, um, even if you're right. And I think that kindness uh, points to uh, what we could all use in um, all of our relationships. For me, I just, you know, it was like a philosophical answer. I feel like love is too wide to be bottled up. And if you bottle it up, it doesn't leave room to have unconditionalism. And I think that's at the heart of when you love somebody, it's unconditional. 
So you're not looking at like, well, you did this for me. Now I can kind of um, respond to that. It's doing things even in when your heart isn't fully into it. And I'm talking about more or less like the butterflies or you feel good to do it. But, you know, being able to, you know, be the first one to say I'm sorry, regardless of feeling like, you know, your your pride was hurt or or you felt like you were right in the argument, but being able to let that go. And for me, um, that's the other portion of love. I think sometimes you have to be willing to let things go as as well. So things go, forgive, forgiveness, man. Forgiveness. Yeah. That's hard. Some people can, you know, I, I work with a lot of people they they, they can't forgive themselves. Uh, you know, uh, I just spoke with uh, a veteran, you know, and he watched my movie and in it, I talked about moral injury. And he said, you know, up until a couple of years ago, he didn't even have the word moral injury in his vocabulary. And I, and I asked him about his religion, his religiosity. And I said, most Judeo-Christian religions and even other, you know, uh, religions you know, uh, are about love and forgiveness, you know, and right. if you can forgive others, you know, you have to look at yourself and forgive yourself. Right. So, you know, it was a perspective that he didn't really think about because he really wasn't that religious. But when we talk about morality, we're talking about something that's based on really uh, religion, religion, you know, and, um, you know, that was, that was help for him to be healing. So, so many people, Often people who are hard on others are hard on themselves, you know? And so, so forgiveness is a important part for a relationship with other people and also to be able to forgive yourself. Yeah, and le learning to love yourself as, as you are, you know what I mean? Like you may be disfigured or um, your hands start cramping up because you're going through contractures, uh, your breathing may be less. Um, and those things can cause a great deal of resentment. I know sometimes I sit back and I'm just like, man, what the heck? Heck, did you did you dive? Not that it was an uncommon thing for me to dive, but it was just for the sheer fact that, you know, it took place and, you know, your hindsight starts picking apart the whole scene. And you're just like, man, like I could have avoided uh, this when, when our reality, when things are going to happen, they're going to happen. They're beyond your control um, sometimes. So, yeah, forgiveness is a big part of um, being able to move forward in, in illustrating love because once you learn how to forgive, not only you, only yourself, but you know you're able to forgive others. And um, the Bible does speak about that. It says you know love covers a multitude of sins. So it it's unconditional. It's, it's, person can do the worst to you, and you still have the ability to be able to um, forgive. But just moving on a little bit, just you know as we talk about communication earlier. Um, effective communication requires an individual to be vulnerable with their potential spouse or partner. Voicing oneself helps to promote intimacy in a relationship. The way you communicate your needs post-injury, has that changed from the way you were prior to your accident? And I mean that, like, like not just only like in a relationship, like, you know, when you were up walking and you dated somebody, you may have spoke this way. But now that you're injured, you might be a little bit more reserved. So how, how do you guys, like, tackle the way that you express your needs to um spouse a significant other past or uh, present. well I'm, I'm personally you guys are both married what uh, five and 18 years i'm married 39 years uh and so it's 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 a long time since i've been dating but when i was before i was in a relationship and after i broke my neck i found i had to be more friendly you know mm. and that that was my i didn't withdraw i had to look at people i had to say hi i had to engage people because if i didn't engage people they would just look and move on and who knows what was going on. So I became more uh, assertive with people, you know, with, with a simple hi or hello or engaging people verbally instead of just letting them go by, you know, with, without quote unquote seeing me, you know? So yeah. uh, my, my reaction was to be more, I don't know, forward, assertive, you will, however you want to say it, but uh right braver in initiating a conversation with a high than I was before my injury. So when you met your wife, was it like that same way? Like, were you just like, hi, I'm, I'm Mitchell. 
like, you know, with a lot of confidence? Or was it like a little bit of reserve because you're just like, uh, I don't know how she's going to take one. Very interesting. So when I met my wife, she was in the same class as me. When I went, when I broke my neck, I was a junior in, in college and then, uh, you know, had to take six months off uh, almost a year and came back. And then I was in a, in a class with her and I thought she was cute <laughs> and she gave a nice. presentation. I wrote down her name and then it turned out we lived in the same dorm. And so I think I was following her back. I used a scooter at the time and I don't, I don't remember. I remember falling on my scooter outside and her helping me. I don't know if that's the first time I said hi or, okay. or whatever, but no, oh, no, our relationship really started. Uh, so now we we saw each other, you know, as far as like in class and stuff. But I, w I went on a spring break or something and I missed some class. So I went over and I asked her, you know, about some stuff, you know, to get notes from stuff I missed. Yeah. And that's when we got to know each other. Uh, so I I initiated it really through going over to her 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 suite which was literally on the same floor it was diagonal wow saying hi you know i miss some some class do you mind helping me out with some notes so it was really i thought she was cute i had my eye on her and then i had a reason to go over there and so that's that's how i did it you know a little, little subtlety yeah a little subtlety that's, that's nice how about you john you always need an excuse you always need an excuse. yeah 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 I, um, that's cool when i first got injured i I was in a program and there was, there was this girl that, uh, that I liked and, but we weren't allowed to date because we were in, we were in this small Christian college program. But as soon as I got injured, I, I was out of the program. So let the dating commence. And <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, from the beginning, it was in a relationship and that didn't, that didn't last. And it didn't last because, you know, we just went separate ways. I wanted to go to college. She wanted to get married, move to Kansas and have lots of kids. And I wanted to finish my degree. <laughs> uh, so that's another reason why, you know, relationships, relationships can end. But I think, I think throughout, throughout college, I, I, I wouldn't say that I became more assertive, but it, it definitely, you know, before I was injured, I, I, I was always a person to give people rides. You know, I, was, I, I was usually at the center of, of, of my social circle because I found ways of making myself useful. Um, gotcha. I really enjoyed uh, serving and and doing things with other people and and also getting them to help me with things. <laughs> so nice. that I found that really difficult post injury, you know, to to be useful in that way to my circle of friends. So I wasn't I you know it was, it was difficult I think after that initial relationship where the person knew me before my injury and it just kind of flowed into it after my disability. It was nice. it was really hard to pursue relationships after that. And I think it, was, it wasn't until I, I graduated college and I was out in the real world where I wasn't you know, limited to this kind of insular community where I was the only wheelchair user on campus and I really felt like people were kind of pegging me as, as that okay. and, and seeing me differently because of that. Out in the real world, you know, it was, it was very different. That's, that's, when I met, that's when I met my wife over Facebook, you know? through my NGO work and just, you know, networking. Um, so I, I think, you know, communicating needs, it's not necessarily all about needs post-injury, but just like communicating your personality. Once you free your, once you kind of break out of whatever insular community that you feel is either limiting you or knows you in, in some way and you kind of have a hard time changing that perception of yourself within yourself, uh, I think it's a lot easier to to just be yourself in whatever situation you are. And that often does require to be more assertive because people don't walk to you. You have to roll to them, you know. Yeah. But uh, once you break out of your initial community, I think it's a lot easier to do that. Nice. You know, sorry, no, what were you going to say, Mitch? And also, you know, if you're perseverating on your injury and that I'm not lovable and no one's going to like me like this, then it's not going to be comfortable for you to assert yourself and say hi right because you're going to be a constant fear of rejection right because you're rejecting yourself you can't see how anyone's going to love me like this and if you can't see that then it's harder harder to project you know uh, confidence and 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 you know say hey hi how you doing I'd like hey. to get 
Oh, you. Yeah. You had mentioned that in your video uh, to some degree, you, you talked about um, it's not necessarily like post injury, like the injury itself kind of barring you from being in a relationship is more about your confidence level. And that in and of itself can be kind of like attractive uh, to people, you know, because they, they, they get the chance to dive into your character as opposed to looking at your injury. A lot of people have said to me things like, you know, I talking to you, I, w- I would never know you're in a wheelchair because I exude like a level of uh, confidence. And I, and I know for myself, like it was always like that prior to uh, being injured. One of my friends thought I was like just being arrogant. I was just like, no, nah, I'm just, you know, I'm just confident in my my own personal abilities about something. Like if I think I'm really good at something, I'm not going to shy away from it. But being vulnerable was difficult because sometimes that, uh, that confidence could mask some of those insecurities and those were kind of like starting to get revealed because I was questioning those things like, you know, who's going to love me in this condition? Um, you know, having been in a relationship uh, prior to being hurt and that relationship dissolving uh, after I got hurt, you know, it, I wasn't as confident before. So the way that I communicated things was just, I don't, I don't want to say it was timid or anything, but it was more or less like guarded because I didn't want to have to show forth like some of these, you know, weak points uh, yeah. per se. But when I started, uh, when I met my wife, you know, one of the first things that went through my mind before she even came, I was just like, man, I, you know, I didn't know if I wanted her to come to my house. And, you know, but then I started saying like, oh, she might be cute. Like, why not? You don't know what you're going to run into. And she was all of that uh, for me. And we engaged in meaningful conversation um and then beyond that point you know eventually one day she 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 tells a story like this like I cornered her and I was like do you love me and she was like yes I do and she's just like you know you just didn't hesitate and I think getting past those like those guards those walls allows so much more to be in we talked about that earlier you know people who may break up post-injury they don't get the chance to kind of figure out some of the beautiful things that can be found in that relationship uh, beyond the injury, because it's not all about that. You find different techniques. And I read about a couple where the uh, the woman was um, in a wheelchair and they had met each other online and they had been dating, uh, talking for like several months. And then finally, you know, they decided to meet each other and she didn't want to, it didn't sound like she wanted to necessarily tell him certain things but when he did those things naturally it opened up uh for her in terms of communication and like they hit like a corner or something and he put his hand up to shield her from like leaning forward and it made her feel like so at home and at peace because that's not something she had to necessarily tell him to do but he did it anyway and you know 14 years later they're still in a relationship uh with one another so you know i think the injury can change our ways that we talk to people and like Jonathan said not necessarily about your needs like oh I need to be cast or this and that and the third but it's more about um just having a fluid line of communication with one another yeah you know if people could be in relationship and still feel alone or lonely Mm -hmm. uh, if they're not willing to be vulnerable when I see vulnerable Usually that's sharing something that you're afraid that somebody else will not accept in you. We talked about in the beginning that we're all yearn for connection. And I think, and and with a romantic partner, that's really special, but we're also fear of losing that person. And so if we have something that we think that is shameful about us or is negative, and that if that person knew, Mm -hmm. they would certainly leave me. So you're left with your negative feelings without ever having a chance for that person to say, I don't care about your past or I don't care about this. I love you anyway, right? That builds intimacy. So if you put up a wall and you pretend to be strong and pretend that you're perfect, you know, that that's going to really limit the um, the potential of your relationship and of the intimacy in that relationship. It's really the intimacy that helps the relationship stay fresh and grow over time. Nice. Uh, that's pretty cool. And, you know, just about loving yourself, that brings us to question for um, just, uh, you know, I think you put it the right way. You know, you got to give people a chance to love you as you are, not 
you know, stop them dead in their tracks because of your own personal about yourself. So as the saying goes, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but we live in a society where all too often people are body shamed. This has led many people to become insecure, going as far as alternating themselves physically in order to become more attractive so that they are more socially acceptable. How do we change our perception? And have you found beauty beyond the disability? Has this ever made you apprehensive about dating? And Jonathan, I know you, you spoke a little bit about like after that one relationship, you were kind of like, how do you go forward uh, after that? So have you like, how, how do you, how have you dealt with your injury in terms of like your body and just the changes that you've gone through? Like, how have you learned to accept yourself? For for me, playing wheelchair rugby was a huge help uh, in terms of that self self perception. You know, before before my injury, I was I didn't do many sports, but I did extreme sports. You know, I did extreme unicycling. I I loved. I loved it. I loved being the center of attention, riding my unicycle to school, taking it on the school bus, going off and doing tricks with my friends. I, it was awesome. And the creativity in, involved and like the technical skill involved was, was really cool. So wheelchair rugby kind of had the same effect because, you know, everyone, when you, when you get a spinal cord injury, you're like, oh man, I have, I've have to wear this neck collar for like three to six months. I can't transfer to my bed because I might fall on the floor and break my hip you know like everything is super dangerous high risk like what am I going to do for fun ever again and wheelchair rugby just like yeah you transfer into this metal armor chair and you smash <laughs> into the other people and you you throw a, a volleyball at their face and they throw it at your face and it's a blast you know <laughs> um and there's absolutely nothing else like it I don't play wheelchair rugby any, anymore I just don't have time but man for the first few years after injury I mean it made it made me feel invincible again you know playing playing a sport a full contact um and just being with I think the camaraderie like being around other people with the same level of injury I think it will have the same effect whether it's rugby or esports or something else you know just being with a group and having your eye on the goal and you know working as a team I think really helps so and also like yeah, what do you do? I play rugby, you know? It's like, I play <laughs> murder ball. You know, it's great. It helps. That's crazy. Helps yeah, no, wheelchair rugby, man. Like, I look at them guys, like, in the wheelchair. I'm just like, yo, y'all crazy to me. Because I'm, I'm thinking about the fingers. I'm like, you're going full throttle. You're knocking each other down. You're spilling over. And I know, Mitchell, you you uh, played a little rugby Connecticut well. Jammers, I'm man. Like, Way back in the day. Wow. <laughs> like, so, because you're putting your body through a lot of punishment. Yeah. You know what I mean? But at the same time, you're fearless. And there's no shame in that. Because a lot of people can't contend with that. Like, so would you agree, like, as playing like a sport gave you an outlet to be able to redefine what you thought was, quote, unquote, beautiful? You know, you could appreciate what your body can do, you know. So if you can have fun, uh, I did uh, wheelchair racing, you know. I, I did hand cycling, you know, so, you know, when you can participate in these things. So, you know, we, we, also, we often talk about body image, but I also talk about body image and, and body function, right? So there are people who look, let's say, traditionally or whatever, societally, the idea of beautiful, but they're in pain mm -hmm. and they have a poor, you know, quote unquote, body image. Right. Uh, because the way they feel, uh, not because the way they look. So if you look and you're, and you begin to appreciate what you can do, you know, that I can play this sport and I'm having fun doing it, then what your body looks like becomes less important. Now I am going on 40 years post-injury, right? I am not in love with my quad belly. You know, I, I eat well. You know, I use a, an app to measure my macros in, in the food I'm getting. I exercise. Uh, I still got a quad belly, you know? And so like, yeah. but I don't let it keep me from going swimming or to the beach. No. You know what I mean? It, it's, and, and I also, I had Crohn's disease and I have surgery. So I got scars left and right across my belly, you know? And, uh, you know, I... I I don't love it, but I don't, I don't let it, you know, keep me from taking my clothes off or being in a relationship and it doesn't bother me during sex. And, 
uh, I know that I'm in better shape than a lot of able-bodied guys who just don't really even care about their, their waist or their weight, but because it's something that's out there and I really can't control it too much. Uh, you know, I, I have to accept those things that, that aren't, that are, you know, it's not the six pack I once had before I broke my neck. You know, I was a lifeguard and yeah. not a professional gymnast, but I, you know, I liked walking on my hands and doing flips and, you know, I was a springboard diver. So yeah, I miss, I miss the six pack, uh, but I don't let it get in my way either. Definitely. And I, and I can agree to that. Like at the time I was injured, I was 221, just solid six two two twenty one. 221. And then by the time I left the hospital, I had gotten down to 170. So I lost all that muscle I gained. And like you, like I, I was flipping even on the day of the beach, even though that's not what caused my injury, you know, just tumbling on the ground, tumbling in the waves, like, you know, very proficient at doing that. And I've been doing it since I was five. But then there was, there, there's this thing about not necessarily like body shame, but just realizing that man, I used to be physically able to do this. And I was physically able to do that. So now that I have children, you know, and they're into some of the same things that I'm into, I don't have necessarily all the, um, the pictures or the videos to show them what I was able to do before. So then I have to try to articulate it in a different way to say like, you know, sometimes like, son is like, did you ever run off a wall and then do a backflip afterwards? And then jump and do this and i'm just like of course i was able to do that i did this and did that so sometimes it gets difficult to be able to articulate it so not so much body shaming because like you said like you know take off your shirt you go somewhere you go swimming that doesn't um interfere with those things but i know for me just being able to to be able to show that like you know these are things that aren't so far-fetched or wasn't able to do but you know, I it, it it didn't make me too apprehensive about dating. I think I was more about can you understand and accept those changes? Like you have a bad spasm or something, right? And you know, you you dang near slouched in the chair. Now you gotta do a press release, boost me up, and do those things. So I think it was more about the fear of do, can you understand why these things are happening to me and that they are beyond um my control um but you know i definitely have found like some high points in it and a lot of that confidence came from people saying things to me afterwards um just like yo Corey, you still the same person is just you know physically changed or like a girl told me you know she was attracted to me or that uh she uh she liked me or what have you so i'm like wow she liked me in post-injury and i I'm not doing anything like I did before. You know what I mean? So those things are, are the boosters. Yeah, I would have, say, have, you know, accept, accept those positive affirmations. I, I'd say the biggest issue I had after my injury was actually my hands. Mm. So I was worried about what other people, women would feel like with my hands because they were contracted and couldn't use them the same. I was actually taking a massage class in college before I broke my neck. So I loved giving massage and stuff like that. But when I touched somebody after my injury and they said, Oh, your hands feel great. Your hands are so soft and they like the warmth, the energy, you know, I began to say, Oh, okay. So, you know, they're, they look like this and I think they feel bad to other people, but they like the way it feels, you know? And so, you know, to be able to take that in and, and trust that, you know, that people do find you quote unquote attractive for whatever reason, you know, not, not because you're, you know, six, two and two twenty one anymore, you know, right. Find you attractive for other reasons, you know? And, I, and like you said, those are positive affirmations that I think that we all need. And, and when that gives us uh, confidence, then we can move on to other aspects, which um, I think most people who are newly injured they they want to know is, is about the um the sexuality and i know that you could be able to speak to it so you know lastly uh intimacy is mostly focused on physical arousal though this is a very important factor others would argue that true intimacy begins in the mind regardless of injury developing this level of chemistry takes time and effort what value is more important like physical arousal or or like yeah a, like, so intimacy, it's like, like an emotional intimacy yeah like so i remember 
Yeah, and you, you spoke like it was great. Like I said, it was so refreshing to watch your video and to listen to like some of the things that, you know, you were hurt, like, you know, f you know further along than uh, both Jonathan and I were. But you said something to the effect about nobody was teaching or talking about uh, sexuality post injury. Right. And finding that type of criteria and material is very taboo because most people are going to assume. And, you know, just speaking explicitly that, oh, um, it doesn't work anymore or because you can't feel anymore. It's not as pleasant. It's not as pleasing. And I remember like the hospital giving me like a video on it. And these couples were talking about their level of intimacy. And some of them were high level quads, some were paraplegics or what have you. But from a personal standpoint, have you changed your your thought process from it being you know, the physical touch and sensation to more of a, a mental type of uh, connection. I think very much so. And in, in my research on pleasure and orgasm in people with spinal cord injury, we talked in the beginning about that yearning for connection. And the word they used was connectiveness. And mm -hmm. so I talked about every, asked everybody, tell me about your sexuality after your injury. And every, everyone said, it's, it's not the same. It's not normal. And they were focusing on their genital function. And sometimes their first experience was with masturbation. And they said, it wasn't the same. So it's pointless. Why bother? And maybe they had a, a partner who did leave them as we were talking about. Once again, they felt abandoned or their, or their partner avoided having sex with them. So they thought pursuing their sex life was pointless. Why bother? But I asked everybody, and I and I recruited people who self-reported having orgasm and those who didn't, tell me about a peak sexual experience. And people said I needed to be with somebody I trusted. So wow. in this context of trust came also this, this thing about safety, emotional safety. And with trust and safety came a feeling of connectiveness. And that trust, safety, and connectiveness had the ability to transcend any loss because of the spinal cord injury to translate into pleasure and even orgasm. Wow. So it is the connectiveness that really animates us and gives us the ability to take in sensations and that are, that are pleasurable and even orgasmic. Wow. So our mind is so powerful in either, you know, allowing good feelings to, to come to the surface or blocking them. Wow. Right. So when you don't trust, when you don't feel safe, you put up the guards and you also keep yourself from experiencing all the pleasure that you can. So I think that the your your, your psychological, your emotional mindset to be open uh, in that relationship. So, you know, if there's good reasons, there's a lot of people, you know, it, it happens more so with women than men. But if they don't feel safe or they don't feel trusting with their partner, they won't be able to have an orgasm mm. or they can have one by themselves. Right. Right. But they don't want to be, we talk about emotional vulnerability when you're in orgasm, when you're in that kind of pleasure, you are extremely vulnerable. You're usually naked. Right. Uh, and, and you're, you're just totally quote unquote open Right. And and so some people don't want to be in that space with someone they don't trust. So if they're doing a hookup, they may enjoy the sex, but not have an orgasm oh, that, that, or their self or with their with wild. a partner that they trust and they fully can let go and not worry about anything. Then they're freer and their orgasm comes more easily. Well, trust and intimacy leads trust the person and, feeling safe. Tr trust and safety. Trust and safety leads uh, to wow. a sense of connectedness when you could be vulnerable with somebody and feel like you're you're still accepted for who you are and you're still you know loved you know that's uh, i'm talking about good sex in a long-term relationship it's fun to hook up especially you know when you're when you're young and you're trying to figure out anything and it's just great to be able to please a partner right so you're focused on pleasing your partner and that gives you the pleasure you're not really taking in the pleasure. So many guys that don't even have sensation. I've got sensation. People have like no sensation, but just give me an injection and give me an erection that lasts a couple of hours and let me please that girl. And it's exciting. Right. The whole act is exciting, but it may not be as orgasmic as 
a, 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 an interaction that also has you know more more vulnerability, more intimacy behind it. Like the injury doesn't stop the endorphin from firing off inside right. of your mind. Right. And so that's a great part of sex. You know, it's fun. So it's not, I don't, you know, when I talk, I don't mean like everyone's got to be in love to have a good time having sex, you know, but I'm, we're talking, when I'm talking, I'm talking more, more about sexuality in a, in a kind of a, a longer term committed relationship, you know, something that's going to keep you fulfilled for the yeah. long run, not, not like Mc, old McDonald's is not drive through, you know, uh, it, satis- uh, it satisfies. It's like fast food, right? There's fat and there's sugar and it satisfies your hunger in the moment, you know, but over time it may clog your arteries and make you die of a heart attack. Right, right, right. So I'm talking about sustainable sex, sustainable sexuality, sustainable love. I could dig it. That's cool. How about you, Jonathan? Has your mindset shifted from a physical uh, interaction um, to a mental or where are you somewhere in between? Well, to, I'll shift the angle a little bit. So when I, uh, after I met my, my wife, Jessica, or Jesse, uh, we were in separate countries and we would not see each other face to face from the time that we met for about six months. After, after that, um, you know, I, I flew to Colombia. I met her. I was there for like a month. And then I flew back to the States and we were again separate for a month on end. And I would hear from friends. I, I had a friend in like Connecticut who was like, oh, I like this girl. But yeah, you know, she lives in Long Island. I'm in Connecticut. It's so long distance. I don't know if it's going to work out. And I'm like, kidding me. <laughs> um, yeah. My fiance is in another country. <laughs> wow. Uh, and so I, I think from the beginning of our relationship, it was all communication, talking, just, you know, being there every day to share what was going on with our lives. And, and that was, that became the most important thing. And I think that that served really well as a, as a strong foundation for our relationship when we did get married and we did move in together and, and it didn't, I mean, it was, it was different. It was, it was better, but it didn't feel that different. I mean, I have to say like, a, long distance relationships are really hard, but it really, it really helps prepare you for longer relationships in that it, it puts that communication and it puts that daily sharing, mental connectedness, so to speak, you know, at the front in terms of priority. And I, I also think it also made the expectation, you know, me as a person with a disability, that she wasn't there to take care of me. You know, she wasn't in the relationship as my, as my caregiver. I was independent and that was one of the attractive things was that I was traveling on my own. I was doing these things on my own, going, going places. And, and I didn't, I didn't need her to get where I was going. And so I think that expectation was also a part of it. Yeah. You know what? Learning that and what it sounds like to me is just, it's not about performance. It's not about, you know, how long do you think you can go as much as how long can we both take this together? And I think, um, you know, being in a long distance relationship really tests the mental fortitude of the level of intimacy that is without a doubt is going to grow, especially, you know, you compare Long Island to CT, it just depends on where you live. Like if you're in the Bridgeport area, why are you complaining? You know what I mean? Like stop skipping a jump where you're on separate continents, but still making it work because you're, you're looking beyond the, 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 the physical and I know for me like growing to learn that I know when I was like first got hurt I was like okay like like I'm I'm gonna try to mentally you know quote quote like get off on this but it's going it's, it's levels to it where you start realizing that a person's turn-ons aren't always the way that you physically touch or what you can do to them that they're turned on in a variety in a myriad of ways that leads to that connectiveness, which ends up leading to, you know, you know, that, that trust. And then if the person is satisfied and they're, and if they're pleased with something that you're doing other than um, what you think that you're, how you're meeting their need, then that's what matters the most because intimacy is not about, 
you receiving what you want, but giving yourself to that individual in that moment in time, undivided attention. And I know for me, you know, it was it's a constant learning uh, process and I don't mind it at all because I want to learn my wife. I don't want to be 75 and I'm just like, oh, I know everything. No, I, I want to constantly grow because if we don't grow, like, you know, how can, you know, our kids learn anything uh, from it? And I think, you know, Jonathan, you, you talked about that. And, you know, like in an argument, it's almost like, you know, you try to keep that like intimately like away from your kids, but you teach them conflict and resolution at the same token, uh, which is only going to lead to when they get into a relationship later on, they'll know how to work things out. And those things are appealing uh, to people that, you know, you actually listen to their need and and it can be very much uh, pleasing to a person. You know, this is great stuff. And like this whole conversation, I, I think a lot of newly injured people are going to you know, tap into this and, and people who are even further along um, may chime in about it. You know, I took some notes just to summarize everything. You know, we talk about the complexities and maturity of mind and heart being open minded. Um, it's not necessarily helpful to say it's fair, but just understanding those nuances. Um, love can be narcissistic. So, you know, you got to stop reflecting on on yourself as much as learning to reflect on you know, learning to reflect on your or your partner or your spouse. Um, we ought to fo- focus on qualitative aspects of relationships. These are things that those characteristics are what gel the foundation together. Um, you know, with love, you know, keep it in your heart. Uh, it it is what makes us feel lively. It makes us feel like we can continue uh, to push on. Um, you may not be motivated by love full time, but Technically speaking, you are. You're just not motivated by the butterfly. It's not about winning, but it is about forgiveness. And you got to not only be able to forgive that other person, but to forgive yourself. Regardless of your level of injury, be assertive um, and communicate those needs to that uh, person because they're going to want to hear uh, hear what you have to say. Um, before you dismiss somebody, you ought to um, give them a chance to love you as you are and allow them to make the decision instead of you uh, putting the cart before the Course. And when it comes down to being intimate, try to open up the door to allow the person to trust you, and that'll lead to connectiveness. And yeah, I think that I think this is just a, like I said, it's a wonderful conversation, and I, and I hope people will uh, look at this and say to themselves, like, you know what, I can make it. Enter able, we're going to be fine. Well, I don't know, Jonathan, if you have anything else to add, but that was so great. No, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Corey, uh, for your great questions and, and comments and for, for Mitch for sharing. That's cool. Yeah, Corey, that was a really lovely summary. You did a great job. It made us all seem wise listening <laughs> to you reflect on our words. And looking at all that, I, I, I want to throw one thing into the mix, not for discussion now, sure. uh, but, but the last question looked at physical versus mental. And there's a whole nother component, which I'm really into, and that's the energetic. And that's mm. what can't be measured, you know, in the lab, right? And so there's there's energy between people. And and I think sex is about energy exchange, is, 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 is much about fluid exchange. Mm. And when we look at different sexual styles, you know, we talk about energetic. So that's one different way people are turned on. We talk about sensual. So you could have sensual feelings in your, in your face, in your ears, your neck, where you have feelings. So there's people who are energetic, people who are sensual, people who are sexual, like traditionally turned on by genitals and, and genital intercourse. There are people who are kinky. And, and I think you touched on that by saying, you know, it's not always what you think, you know, what people like may be very different and it may have nothing to do with your physical abilities. So you could be able to command and boss somebody around and may, they may like that, you know, so, so there's different aspects to sexual styles and, and the way people relate. So, um, yeah, so I want to, yeah, I, I think that your questions were very well thought out, very, very articulate and, and great you know, to generate this discussion. So thank you both for having me. Again, thank you guys for joining us this evening. Please uh, stay tuned next month for another More Than Walking video podcast discussion. Until then, be hopeful, be encouraged, and stay aware. Have a good night, fellas.